Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless there is something seriously sick and twisted occurring in this country now we would thought we'd seen it all kindergarten drag queen story hour sex changes for kids we don't get shocked by much but then this happened at deer creek high school in oklahoma this video shows high schoolers sucking on each other's toes at a school fundraiser Those were high school students licking peanut butter off their classmates' feet. The school made a point to say no adults' feet were licked for charity. Okay. Whose idea was this? <laughs> Who okayed that? You usually need a permission slip to go to the bathroom. You can't tell me people weren't surprised. This video went crazy. Almost 50 million people saw it. And now it's led to a formal investigation by the Oklahoma State Department of Education. The school district had to come out and say this, quote, through this specific game, we failed to uphold the dignity of our students and the proud image of our community. We fell short, and for that, we greatly apologize. Liberals are defending child sex dolls. In the Kentucky State Senate last week, state lawmakers were debating a bill that would criminalize the possession and trafficking of a child sex doll. How many child sex dolls are there anyway? We don't know. One probably feels like too many, but not everybody agrees with us. A Democrat state senator from Kentucky, Karen Berg, there she is, did some Googling and thinks the child sex dolls are a good thing. I was completely unfamiliar with child sex dolls, so I had, of course, to Google it last night. Minor attracted persons. And the limited amount of research that's done on these dolls, guys, suggests that they actually, for people who are attracted to minors, that these dolls actually decrease their proclivity to go out and attack children, that it actually gives them a release. Oh, it gives them a release. That settles it. Child sex dolls for everybody. Seems like Berg came to her senses and then released a statement saying, as a mom and a physician, I am, of course, deeply concerned with the harm of pedophilia, and I regret in my question the committee didn't convey that. I voted in favor to outlaw child sex dolls, thank God. But why does the left keep trying to normalize pedophilia? And why do they call them minor attracted persons? Let's bring in clinical psychologist, Dr. Chloe Carmichael. Before we get to the child sex dolls, can we talk about the sucking of the toes? What purpose would that serve? Well, Jesse, that's a very good question. And I know that the school tried to say, well, no adults, you know, toes were sucked. But nevertheless, they monetized the experience of high schoolers doing this to each other. And when we are in an environment where people are using ridiculous terms like minor attracted persons, and we have an epidemic of child porn, both children being featured in and consuming porn, and I'm sure in their comprehensive sex education, they probably cover kink and everything else now. And so there they then decided to have these high schoolers doing this to each other at an event that was for fundraising. On some level, this experience was monetized, and that is disgusting. The school should it's be completely ashamed. A, a foot fetish fundraiser. You, you have adults, you have gym teachers and administrators sitting there in the bleachers watching kids suck each other's toes for money. Every adult in that room should be ashamed of themselves when that school put out a statement saying we failed to uphold the dignity. More, they, they actively degraded the dignity by encouraging or even permitting, as you said, children need a permission slip to go to the bathroom, much less to engage in this type of activity. These children who have been isolated through COVID and again exposed to this 
porn epidemic, and now we're going to encourage them to lie on the floor and suck each other's toes in a monetized environment. I honestly think that there should be a lot of firings that occur in firings. Oklahoma very there soon. There should be arrests. That's what there should be. These child sex Definitely. dolls, is there any research that shows that child sex dolls would reduce child sexual abuse? Well, first of all, Jesse, even if there were such research, I would be extremely skeptical of it. But I did yeah. do a brief review of this supposed literature. And no, there's not even, you know, such a convincing, quote, body of literature. But as a clinical psychologist, what I would say is that that being with a child sex doll would be tantamount to what we call cognitive rehearsal, where you are actively doing, just like we know a basketball player can visualize himself making the basket and then he'll do it. That's what these doll props would be. They also encourage what we call cognitive elaboration, where maybe you have a curiosity or a fantasy, and then with this prop, you go ahead and you start elaborating on it. Even worse is the insinuation that this is in some way therapeutic, because what's next? Are taxpayers going to be paying for somebody's therapy <laughs> child sex doll? Yeah, and are we going to give domestic abusers a doll of their wife that they can smack that doll around, and we're going to tell them that that's therapeutic? Yeah, it's one of those boxing dummies. Just give every domestic abuser, one of those. Problem solved. And this is happening in Kentucky and the toe-licking Oklahoma. States I'd never it thought I'd see experience that kind of depravity. When the world crossed the line with gay marriage, those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ knew that sexual immorality would now progress into an anything goes mentality. After the gays got their right to marry, it wouldn't stop there. The pedophiles now want their sin legalized and we are seeing a big push for sexualizing children. God gives a dire warning to anyone who would cause a child to sin, as we read in Matthew 18, 6 and 7. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. A new warning from President Biden if a ceasefire deal is not reached before the start of the holy month of Ramadan this weekend. The stakes are sky high with President Biden warning if there isn't a ceasefire deal in place for the beginning of Ramadan at the end of this week, then the situation in Israel and specifically here in Jerusalem could be very dangerous. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. As the war in Gaza continues, negotiators in Egypt have yet to achieve a breakthrough with Hamas for a ceasefire. President Biden says Israel has done its part, and now it's up to the terror group to reach an agreement. The hostage deal is in the hands of Hamas right now, okay. because there's been an offer, a rational offer. The Israelis have agreed to it. Hamas leaders reject the idea of a temporary ceasefire, calling it a trick by America and Israel to let the Jewish nation just keep on killing Palestinians in Gaza. I think it's a political farce for the American administration to support the Israeli opinion that Israel has the right to stop killing for a few weeks and then return to that killing. The U.S. counters Hamas could end the fighting today. They could end this entire conflict. Right. We don't need a temporary ceasefire. Hamas would lay down their weapons and stop fighting. You could have a permanent ceasefire because Israel would have accomplished its military objectives. Um, with respect to the temporary ceasefire that we are trying to achieve, uh, we very much think that 
an agreement is, re is reachable. The Islamic holy month Ramadan, the unofficial deadline for an agreement, begins in a few days and has often been a time of increased Muslim violence. Hamas, Iran, and its other proxies in the region are openly for more October 7th style attacks, but this time in Jerusalem and on the Temple Mount. There's got to be a ceasefire because Ramadan, if we get into a circumstance where this continues through Ramadan, Israel and Jerusalem, again, it could be very, very dangerous. For instance, Turkey's president is warning Israel not to restrict access to the Temple Mount for Muslims during Ramadan or it will face real trouble. The consequences of taking such a step will undoubtedly be very severe. Israel's prime minister is reassuring the world that his nation will protect religious freedom. We will do everything to preserve the freedom of worship on the Temple Mount. Israel's policy has always been and always will be to maintain freedom of worship for all religions. Meanwhile, as Iran's proxy Hezbollah starts firing many more missiles into northern Israel, the Jewish nation's defense minister warns that Hezbollah's increased aggression is, quote, dragging the parties to a dangerous escalation. The U.S. is trying to work out a peace deal between Israel and Hezbollah, and some Israelis warn America must succeed or fighting could spiral out of control. The U.S. wants to avoid a regional and maybe global war. It needs to show leadership and they really, really deter Iran and Hezbollah. Daniel 9, 26 and 27. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, who is Israel, the Palestinians, and possibly other Muslim nations, for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In Bible prophecy, we are told in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, the prince who is to come, who is the Antichrist, will come on the world scene and strongly confirm a seven-year covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies. This covenant will kick off the seven-year tribulation. We see the prophesied Antichrist right onto the world stage in Revelation 6, 2. Immediately following the rider of the white horse beginning his conquest of the world, we see peace will be taken from the earth when the rider of the red horse of war begins his ride across the earth as we read in Revelation 6, 3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Those who are here to see this will be as those who lived in the days of Noah. All will be well and life will be moving forward as normal when suddenly a flood of God's judgment will begin to fall on mankind which will last for seven years. The culmination of which will be the visible, physical, bodily return of Jesus Christ to the earth at Armageddon. So as we look at what prophecy predicts is going to occur, potentially in the not too distant future, the world is someday going to rejoice that peace has finally come to the Middle East. What will follow that, however? will be anything but peace as the world is suddenly going to explode into warfare. All those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will not be here to see the terrible time to come wherein God's judgment will fall upon a world that has forgotten Him. Where will we be? In the presence of Jesus Christ our Lord as a result of the rapture of the church. And there will be no announcement as to when that will take place whatsoever prior to it occurring. And if you find yourself here after it occurs, your future is going to be horrific. The stage is being set for Daniel's prophecy concerning the arrival of the Antichrist, which will be preceded by the rapture of the church. The only conclusion one can draw from all this is this. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Consider this a heads up if you're a Christian, and be forewarned if you're a non-believer. If you're watching this and you don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, it's time to get to know Him, and the sooner the better. And the U.S. Central Command says an anti-ship ballistic missile fired by Yemen's Houthi rebels hit a Swiss-owned and Israeli-operated container vessel in the Gulf of Aden, causing minor damage. The U.S. responded. In Sahana, a Houthi military spokesman said it had targeted what it called the Israeli ship MSC Sky in the Arabian Sea. The Swiss shipping giant MSC owns the librarian-flagged vessel, listed as operated by the Israeli Zim Shipping Service. A second missile fired by the Houthis missed its target. Initial reports indicate there were no injuries. The ship did not request assistance 
and continued on its way. The attack came at around 4 a.m. Sahana time. It came about two hours after another missile was fired into the Southern Red Sea, the military says. The U.S. Navy conducted self-defense strikes against two anti-ship cruise missiles that presented an immediate threat to merchant vessels and U.S. Navy ships in the region. In January, MSC said it was not transiting the Red Sea due to danger to its vessels. Iran-backed Houthi terrorists have launched attacks on shipping in the Red Sea region since November in solidarity with Palestinians in the Israeli Hamas war in Gaza. The Rube Mayer cargo ship sank on Friday, becoming the first vessel lost since the Houthis began their attacks. And U.S. Special Envoy Amos Hochstein is due in Israel after meetings in Beirut failed to encourage him that a diplomatic solution is at hand amid intensifying cross-border exchanges between the IDF and Hezbollah, warning that a limited war is not containable. At least 10 rockets were fired from Lebanon at the Western Galilee. Some of the projectiles were intercepted by the Iron Dome air defense system. There are no reports of injuries in the attack. In response to the launches toward the area of Margaliot in northern Israel, fighter jets struck a series of Hezbollah terror targets in the areas of Bin Jabil, Sultania, and Sedikin. Among the targets struck were Hezbollah military structures and a military command and control center used by the terrorist group. As the cross-border fighting was ongoing in the south, U.S. Special Envoy Amos Hochstein was in Beirut, still seeking a diplomatic solution. I am mindful that my arrival comes on the heels of a tense few weeks on both sides of the border. Escalation of violence is in no one's interest and there is no such thing as a limited war. Escalation will not help the Lebanese and Israeli people return home. Escalation will not resolve this crisis. Hochstein told Lebanese officials that even a pause in fighting in Gaza will not bring quiet to Lebanon or Israel. It does not necessarily happen that when you have a ceasefire in Gaza, it just automatically extends. That is why we're here today, to be able to have a conversation and discussion on what the kind of arrangements that could be reached here in Lebanon. Hochstein insisted that there must be a diplomatic solution that pushes Hezbollah permanently away from the border. The Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. This man is essentially holding Haiti hostage. Jimmy Charizier, nicknamed Barbecue, a gang leader, former police officer, and now determined to bring down the government, demanding Prime Minister Ariel Henry resign. I want Ariel to hear the reason, because if Ariel Henry does not resign, the country will go straight to a genocide. If the international community continues to support Ariel Henry, it will lead us straight into a civil war. That will lead to a genocide. Recent speculation over Henri's whereabouts is now over. These still photos appear to show him landing in Puerto Rico. Fighting between gangs in the army around the main airport in the Haitian capital has led to flights being cancelled since Sunday. The fighting has also displaced thousands of people. I would like the government to say something because we do not have any hope. No one is helping us. I would like the government to talk to us, to remove us from the situation because we do not feel safe. Everywhere is gang violence. We are sleeping and we have to be vigilant. But there is little law left here. And the longer the prime minister is away, analysts say, the weaker he becomes.
Henri was sworn in, unelected, after Haiti's president, Jovenel Moise, was assassinated in 2021 by Colombian mercenaries. Elections were supposed to be held by the 7th of February, but they haven't happened, and that sparked protests at the time. Henri left for Kenya last week to finalize a deal for a UN task force to help restore order in his country, prompting this latest crisis. I've been working in and on around Haiti for 30 years now, and I've never, ever seen it this bad. It's absolutely catastrophic, it being the human rights situation, the humanitarian situation, the lack of any kind of political anything, discussions, negotiations. Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the world. Heavily armed gangs are now in charge of most of the capital, and it's not clear if or when the prime minister will return. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. It seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The signs of Jesus soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation. Repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready 
when he makes his personal appearance. My God! What if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.